A very good evening to you. I'm Lisa Lord and making headlines. The Central Bank of Barbados introduces measures to help support commercial banks amid the COVID-19 crisis. Barbadians advised about ensuring the safety of medical personnel during this period. Some local businesses experiencing a surge in demand during the shutdown. And in sports, July 24th to August 8th, the new dates for the Tokyo Olympics. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. In our top story, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to hammer global economies, Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Cleveston Haynes, says he is expecting economic activity to contract, bringing with it the potential for significant job losses. The governor made the comment today as the bank announced a set of new monetary policy measures mainly intended to support the domestic banking sector in light of the projected impact of COVID-19 on the economy and the financial system. Our Ryan Broom has been following that story and joins us live now with the details. Good evening to you, Ryan. Good evening, Lisa. Well, yes, the Governor Haynes has noted that COVID-19 has had a crippling effect on the global economy with the impact of global tourism leading to the suspension of incoming flights to Barbados and the closure of hotels, attractions and restaurants, which in turn has impacted other ancillary sectors. So, Lisa, among the major changes that will be coming for the banks, with effect from this Wednesday, April 1st, the bank's discount rate at which it provides overnight lending to banks and deposit-taking non-banks licensed under the Financial Institutions Act will be reduced from 7% to 2%. Now, the bank will also reduce the securities ratio for commercial banks from 17.5% to 5%. Now, this essentially refers to the amount of government paper, like government bonds, they are required to hold. In addition to that, the central bank will also eliminate the 1.5% securities ratio for non-banking deposit-taking licensees. Additionally, the bank says it also stands ready to make collateralized loans for up to six months as liquidity support for licensees, again, if necessary. And in his statement, the governor notes the bank is supporting the commercial bank's efforts to work with their customers, as we've heard already, to ease the cash flow difficulties that are likely to emerge. And Governor Haynes has acknowledged, however, these actions by the commercial banks could adversely affect these institutions' profitability and liquidity. And given these circumstances, he says the central bank will enhance its monitoring and review its supervisory policies to enable the institutions to address COVID-19-related problems. And the bank says these measures, coupled with those of the government and the commercial banks, represent a multi-pronged response to dampen the effects of COVID-19 and should help to preserve financial stability and enable a faster turnaround in the, in the economy once the crisis is over. So Lisa, there you have it, uh, an indication that the central bank is responding to those actions by the commercial banks uh, to just more or less regularize the system after those measures. A long road ahead. Thank you so much, Ryan, for the details. Now a call for Barbadians to remain strong, hold faith and keep the Bajan spirit alive as Barbados combats the threats posed by COVID-19. Governor General Dame Sandra Mason in an address to the nation says the country has faced difficult circumstances and global crises in the past and has emerged stronger. COVID-19 is pushing us to once again value human life, companionship, friends, relatives, neighbors, the sense of community and quiet time to be grateful for what we have. Barbadians are compassionate, resilient, strong and tenacious. CARICOM looks to Barbados for the best models of leadership. All over the world, our personal discipline and national governance structures are respected. In this time of crisis, we must be true to who we are. Dame Sandra paid tribute to the workers on the front line and others keeping the country running at this time. She also called for prayers in the face of uncertainty. The children of the community belonged to all of us. Our seniors were not abandoned. They were treated with appreciation and respect. Families and communities looked after each other. This sense of caring created social cohesion. We must keep that Bajan spirit alive. In it lies our past success and our current survival. 
The Governor General, who has signed into law the amendment to the emergency COVID-19 curfew directive, says Barbados is prepared and ready to fight the virus. She urged cooperation and called on residents to adhere to the guidelines and safety protocols. Barbadians at home at this time have been challenged to be productive, innovative and creative and use technology. It is in crises like this that heroes and heroines emerge. It is in times like this that a country can rise to have its finest hour. I want to thank all Barbadians working on the front lines of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Healthcare professionals, the police force and the defense force, those in essential services, those maintaining our water and electricity services, those going to work every day to ensure Barbadians have food, medicines and other essentials the supply truck and public vehicle drivers and our garbage collectors. Well, as the country works to contain the spread of COVID-19, Barbadians are being reminded of the importance of social distancing, particularly as it relates to the healthcare sector. The point was raised during last evening's broadcast of CBC TV 8's The People's Business by UE's lecturer in family medicine, Dr. Joseph Herbert, and lecturer in epidemiology, Dr. Natasha Sobers. Dr. Sobers says, especially in cases where symptoms are mild, it's best to call ahead so that medical personnel can advise and prepare accordingly. What we want to do is that to make sure that we have the resources for those who need them. So that's why we're giving so the instructions in terms of if you have mild symptoms, you may want to call first and so on, because we want to make sure that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed with cases that can potentially be managed at home. Well, Dr. Sober says ensuring the safety of healthcare workers is crucial. We can bring in things like ventilators, um, and I'm sure the government is working on that, but it is very difficult to bring in and replace um, healthcare workers. Uh, so if we overwhelm the system, we will overwhelm our healthcare workers. They have the potential to get to also become ill. Um, so I want people to be very mindful of the instructions in terms of calling the COVID um, hotline, calling your healthcare provider if you have respiratory symptoms, because we do not, we want to make sure the system is um, reserved for those who are most in need of the system. Also on the people's business was Minister of Elder Affairs and People Empowerment, Cynthia Ford. She disclosed that a determination is to be made as to whether government daycare nurseries should remain open. Now, there has been a drastic drop in the number of children attending these facilities over the past week. But Minister Ford says consideration for the children of frontline workers is one of the main reasons why they have not already taken a decision to close. We were looking to make sure we did not close our and then persons will be disadvantaged, particularly those frontline people who have to be able to be defense force, the doctors, the nurses, other social workers. So the determination will be made fully tomorrow by the time we see what the response is, because we believe that every one of those frontline worker, workers should be protected as well. Thank you very and much. And that their children should be secured. Meantime, Minister Ford says more people are turning to the welfare departments as the coronavirus impacts their daily life and work. She says there is a level of anxiety among Barbadians and the welfare department is seeing people who have never been recipients before. Did announce on Friday night from Parliament that there will be a $600 amount to help families to keep from falling between the cracks. So already, because that has not been fully put in place, but people are still going to the welfare. So you are seeing long lines, but we will try as best as possible to be able to lessen whatever is happening, take out some of the anxiety by letting them know, stay away from the crowds as far as possible. You need your social distance. Well, Barbados borders have not been closed, but screening at the island's ports of entry have been stepped up in light of the coronavirus. Medical Officer of Health with responsibility for the ports of entry, Dr. Monohar Singh, says they are leaving nothing to chance with those entering the country. 
Those on the front line in the tourism industry, specifically tour and taxi operators, are being sensitized about the dangers of the coronavirus and what they can do to safeguard themselves and their passengers. Medical Officer of Health with responsibility for ports of entry, Dr. Monahar Singh, conducted a sensitization workshop at Pelican over the weekend. He says the teams at the ports of entry are doing all they can to identify the imported cases. Whether it is in the airport or in the Bridgetown Seaport or it is in the Port Charles or Port Ferdinand, all the yachts, small yachts, up to the big vessels, including the flights, all the people were screened. Especially now um, the defense forces, the people also helping us, they are also helping screening, especially thermal temperature scanning they are doing in the airports and the seaports at the time of the arrival to the Barbados. The Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. organized the workshop. Chief Product Development Officer Marsha Aline says the session was important as the operators are regarded as the backbone of the industry. They make up the people of Barbados that our visitors continually say that are the reasons why they actually come to the island. And so we know that they're on the front line. We know there are taxi drivers, probably know Barbados more or better than most Barbadians. They sell the, the destination in a way that none of us who are in the policy making element of the tourism industry are unable to do. Derek Morris, who has been a taxi driver for about 20 years, says there simply is no work at this time. We were averaging basically one job a day last week. There's nothing this week, so I won't be able to tell you what's the situation with the visitors because we haven't been seeing many of them. The Barbados Transport Co-op Society Limited was also represented at that meeting. Secretary Charles Holligan says most of their work comes from airlines and with the Grant Lee Adams International Airport now a virtual ghost town, their livelihood is at a standstill. Some sad news now. There have been two more COVID-19 related deaths in the Barbadian community in the New York jurisdiction. They are Don Drew Gibbons, formerly of Vault Road St. Thomas, and second generation Barbadian Michelle Boxill. Gibbons' death was reported on Sunday and Boxill's earlier today. The news comes just a day after it was revealed to other Barbadians living in New York had already succumbed to COVID-19. Later tonight at 8, we are expected to get an update on the COVID situation here in Barbados from Health Minister. Mr. Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Bostig. Well, while the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the closure of some Barbadian businesses, others have seen a surge in demand for their services. Among them, companies specializing in home deliveries. Sharika Griffith reports. Think of it as an Uber for groceries. Price World and WeFetch are just two of the companies enabling Barbadians to order groceries and other essentials and delivering them to their homes. With many Barbadians flocking to supermarkets to stock up on food and medicine, demand for companies which provide these services has drastically increased. I think people have started paying, paying a lot more attention to their own personal safety, so they started to utilize the platform and ordering their groceries from home and having the groceries delivered to the home as opposed to coming to Costa Less or coming to Price Smart or wherever else. People have been asking us to collect fish from the fish market and deliver it to them as well. So people are definitely utilizing the service. The experience has been the same for WeFetch, which was founded just a week ago by Lily Dash and Sophie Bannister. The demand is insane. We, I don't know what we really expected when we first started it, but it's been, you know, all to the charts. We've had we processed thousands and thousands of dollars in um, delivery uh, groceries already. Unfortunately, Chief Technical Officer of Price World, Teddy Leon, says the main people being advised to stay at home, the elderly, have not been the primary users of the service. Which is interesting because we're offering free delivery to everyone over 70 years old. But I think it's probably because it's technology related and we need to try to promote more the whole email ordering system. And with citizens being warned to practice social distancing, both companies have introduced contactless deliveries. Which is why we facilitate online payments, you know, via um, credit card and money, PayPal. We do accept cash, um, but we try to minimize it as best as possible. 
but we're doing the best with what we have, you know what I mean? The growth in business has also prompted Price World to increase its staff complement. In fact, at the time of filming, Mr. Leon was busy conducting several on-the-job interviews. He says many applicants are people who worked in the tourism industry but have found themselves unemployed in recent times. 23-year-old Anissa Duplessis is one such individual, a former demi-chef de partie at the now-closed Hugo's restaurant. I'm really and truly I'm just looking to, you know, somewhat get some type of income for the time being. I'm the type of individual that get really bored at home. So it's not really a case, honestly, it's not really a case of the income. I just really don't want to be at home, to be quite honest. Um, but yeah, so I'm just looking to keep myself occupied and going for the time being. I am a chef by trade, so obviously I will still be looking forward to getting back into that sometime. So hopefully, you know, probably a year, year and a half, I don't know how long. Delivery services for meals, groceries and medical supplies are among the list of essential businesses allowed to operate during the partial shutdown imposed by government. Sharika Griffith, CBC News. But still to come, a pastor in Antigua in trouble with the law for failure to comply with public health regulations banning gatherings in excess of 25 people. Then the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games rescheduled to start on July 23rd next year. But first, this tip from Cooperators General Insurance. This tip of the day is brought to you by Cooperators General Insurance Company Limited. Insurance the way you want it to be. Focus on the person, not the disability, and don't bring it up unless it's relevant. This tip is brought to you in association with the Barbados Council for the Disabled, helping to sensitize and inform the public. Regional news now. Pastor Uriah Taylor of the New Testament Church of God in Boland, Antigua, has been remanded to prison after pleading guilty to failure to comply with public health regulations, banning gatherings in excess of 25 people. Now, police moved in to end a service at the church yesterday and disperse the worshippers. After receiving reports, there were more than 25 people in attendance. The event was captured in a video that has since gone viral on social media. Meanwhile, Alston Turner, a member of the church, pleaded guilty to battery on police, obstruction and resisting arrest. He too was remanded. The integrity of tests conducted by the Caribbean Examinations Council will not be compromised by COVID-19. The assurance from, is coming from Registrar Dr. Wayne Wesley. CXC exams have already been delayed until July in light of the global pandemic. Dr. Wesley says whatever they do is always in the best interest of all stakeholders involved. The approach which we have taken in terms of at least utilizing one common measure because the principle of assessment requires that if you're administering a public examination such as CXC, and we are not only doing it within one territory, we are doing it across the region, it's therefore important that we do get a common Well, the CXC registrar says once all goes Order. according to plan, he is hopeful that the results will be returned by late August, early September, so that those seeking higher education are not disadvantaged with their applications. He says COVID-19 has shown the urgency for our digital transformation to move off in earnest.